You've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting The Black Man with the Gun Show. This week, how to shoot your handgun better. In our history feature, we're going to talk about Ida B. Wells. She's my woman honoree of the week. The importance of training with one system. Michael J. Willen talks about how he became a precision shooter. And I got a special guest, a blogger, that blogs at daddies-gun.com. And he honors Philando Castile in an article that I asked him to read for you that he put out this past July. Hi, my name is Reverend Ken Blanchard, the guy known as the black man with a gun. And this is the podcast of the African-American gun community, amplifying our voices with American history, sharing training, news, and positive information for all America. Welcome to the show. Believe it or not, this is episode number 538 of the Black Man with a Gun Show podcast. And I want to thank you for being here. Let's talk a little bit about shooting. No matter which gun podcast that you listen to, whether you're talking about the newest review or what's really cool at the shot show or what you just shot or saw on YouTube. The real deal is that you become proficient with one gun. In a time of trouble, you're going to probably just have one firearm. You need to be the master of that one mechanical device. I know you got about four or five in your safe. I know you got a couple that you want to buy. I know there's somebody on the other side of you that has a cooler gun than you got, but that doesn't matter. You need to be smoking with that one firearm. I don't care if it's a high point, a Nighthawk Custom, a Wilson Combat, a Smith & Wesson anything, a Glock anything, an m and X, or any of the multitude of firearms that are out here. You must be good with one. So good that there's no question that when you fire the trigger, there's basically just one hole. Until you get to that point, you need to practice. Training saves lives. Pulling the trigger is the action the operator performs to discharge a firearm. While it's all easy in concept, it creates a lot of problems for most shooters and even experienced ones. I know we live in a time of high speed, low drag, and everybody has been an operator. Everybody has had multiple de- deployments overseas. Everybody is an X this or, or whatever that. But I'm telling you, if you want to be a good shot, you must master the basics. Yeah, it's kind of like sex. Almost anybody can do it, but only a few are really good at it. Let that marinate for a minute. You want to hold the gun firmly with your proper grip. You want to align the sights on the target. You want to place the center of the first pad of your trigger finger on the trigger. You want to begin by pressing the trigger rearward smoothly without moving anything else or while moving everything else as little as possible. And once you have created enough pressure on that trigger, it will move sometimes imperceptibly until the striker, the firing pin, or the hammer in the gun is activated and starts the ignition process, firing the gun. Several things happen in the gun to cause it to fire. The part you control is pulling the trigger. If done correctly, nothing moves, not your hands or the sight picture. And the pistol fires the round exactly where you intended. But if you jerk, if you flinch before or at the instant you fire the gun, the shot will most likely go somewhere else other than where you want it to go. So, in my experience, a good trigger pull is one of, if not the most important aspect of shooting well. Spend as much time as you can perfecting that trigger pull. Top marksmen can pull the trigger so well that they never move the gun out of alignment. You have to master the gun. And like that old joke about gun control, your grip is really, really important. You have to hold that gun tight, sometimes tighter than you think. And this is the most, the biggest problem with most shooters. How you start off is how you finish. Do me a favor and let me know what gun you're going to master in the future. 
just send me a note. I know you heard this show. You can say, Ken, I'm going to master the Glock. I'm going to master the Smith & Wesson. I'm going to master my revolver. I'm going to master this high point. I'm going to, ma- you know, whatever. Whatever you're going to master, let me know. That way I can give you some feedback because we're going to do a little bit of this every week to remind you of how important it is. You got this. I'm going to help you get there. Master yourself today. Conquer the world tomorrow. This portion of the show is sponsored by CrossbreedHolsters.com. Crossbreed Holsters has gained national recognition as a maker of the best and most functional concealment holsters available on the market today. Each holster is handcrafted to ensure your firearm is safe and secure while carrying, combined with the best customer service in the industry. Visit CrossbreedHolsters.com. Let's talk a little history. This week on the show, I want to give you the name of an American journalist and activist that led the anti-lynching crusade in the 1890s here in the U.S. She worked to advance other political causes as well. She protested the exclusion of African Americans from the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And three years later, she helped launch the National Association of Colored Women. In 1909, she was the founding member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And she actively campaigned for women's right to vote. Ida B. Wells the daughter of slaves, born Holly Springs, Mississippi, July 16th, 1862. Born a slave in 1862, Ida Bell Wells was the oldest daughter of James and Lizzie Wells. The Wells family, as well as the rest of the slaves of the Confederate States, were decreed free by the Union about six months after Ida's birth, thanks to the Emancipation Proclamation. However, Living in Mississippi, as black people, they faced racial prejudices and were restricted by discriminatory rules and practices. Ida B. Wells' parents were active in the Republican Party during Reconstruction. Her father, James, was involved with the Freedmen's Aid Society and helped start Shaw University, a school for the newly freed slaves now known as Rust College, and served on the first board of trustees. It was there that Ida B. Wells received her early schooling, but she had to drop out at the age of 16 when tragedy struck her family. Both her her parents and one of her siblings died in a yellow fever outbreak, leaving Wells to care for her other siblings. Ever resourceful, she convinced a nearby country school administrator that she was 18 and landed a job as a teacher. Her parents were able to support their seven children because her mother was a famous cook and her father was a skilled carpenter. She managed to continue her education by attending the nearby Rust College. She eventually moved to Memphis to live with her aunt and help raise her youngest sisters. She became a vocal critic of the conditions of blacks only schools in the city. In 1891, she was fired from her job for these attacks. She championed another cause after the murder of a friend and his two business associates. In 1892, three African American men, Tom Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart, set up a grocery store in Memphis. Their new business drew customers away from a white-owned store in the neighborhood, and the white store owner and his supporters clashed with the three men on a few occasions. One night, Moss and the others guarded their store against attack and ended up shooting several of the white vandals. They were arrested and brought to jail. But they didn't have a chance to defend themselves against the charges. A lynch mob took them from their cells and murdered them. These brutal killings incensed Wells, leading her to write articles decrying the lynching of her friend and the wrongful deaths of other African Americans. Putting her own life at risk, she spent two months traveling in the South, gathering information on other lynching incidents. One editorial seemed to push some of the city's whites over the edge. A mob stormed the office of her newspaper, destroying all of her equipment. Fortunately, Wells had been traveling to New York City at the time, She was warned that she would be killed if she ever returned to Memphis. Incensed by the murders of her friends, Wells launched an extensive investigation of lynching. In 1892, she published a pamphlet, Southern Horrors, which detailed her findings. 
through her lectures and books, such as A Red Record in 1895, Wells countered the, quote, rape myth used by lynch mobs to justify the murder of African Americans. Through her research, she found that lynch victims had challenged white authority or had successfully competed with whites in business or politics. She also wrote an in-depth report on the lynching in America for the New York Age, an African-American newspaper run by former slave T. Thomas Fortune. Wells took her movement to England and established the British Anti-Lynching Society in 1894. She returned to the U.S., settled in Chicago, where she married attorney and newspaper editor Ferdinand L. Barnett in 1895. As I said before, Ida B. Wells established several civil rights organizations. In 1896, she formed the National Association of Colored Women. After brutal assaults on the African-American community in Springfield, Illinois, in 1908, Wells sought to take action. The following year, she attended a special conference for the organization that would later become known as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Though she is considered a founding member of the NAACP, Wells later cut ties with the organization. She explained her decision thereafter, stating that she felt the organization, in its infancy at the time, had lacked action-based initiative. Working on behalf of all women, Wells, as part of her work with the National Equal Rights League, called for President Woodrow Wilson to put an end to discriminatory hiring practices for government jobs. She created the first African-American kindergarten in her community and fought for women's suffrage. In 1930, Wells made an unsuccessful bid for the state Senate. Health problems plagued her the following year. Ida B. Wells died of kidney disease on March 25, 1931, at the age of 68 in Chicago, Illinois. She left behind an impressive legacy of social and political heroism. With her writings, speeches, and protests, Wells fought against prejudice, no matter what potential dangers she faced. She once said, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. Wells first began protesting the treatment of black Southerners when on a train ride between Memphis and her job at a rural school, the conductor told her that she must move to the train's smoking car. She refused, arguing that if she had purchased a first-class ticket. The conductor and other passengers then tried to physically remove her from the train. She returned to Memphis, hired a lawyer, and sued the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company. The court decided in her favor, awarding her $500. The railroad company appealed, and in 1887, the Supreme Court of Tennessee reversed the previous decision and ordered Wells to pay court fees. Using the pseudonym Lola, Wells began to write editorials in black newspapers that challenged Jim Crow laws in the South. She bought a share of the Memphis newspaper, the Free Speech and Headlight, and used it to further the cause of African American civil rights. And now if I can get a little raw with you, let me tell you some more stuff about Miss Ida B. Wells. This is from a book called Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms by my friend and brother professor, Nicholas Johnson. He wrote, Surveying the landscape in the summer of 1892, Ida B. Wells advised that, quote, the Winchester rifle deserved a place of honor in every black home, end quote. This was no empty rhetorical jab. She was advancing a considered personal security policy and specifically referencing two recent episodes where armed blacks saved their neighbors from lynch mobs. Twice within one month, lynch mobs formed one in Paducah, Kentucky, another in Jacksonville, Florida. Squared in their sights were hapless Negroes who were on track to the same fate as many others before them. But in both cases, the mobs were thwarted by armed blacks. Though the record demands some speculation about how many of their guns were actually Winchester rifles, other similar episodes in Mississippi and Georgia confirmed for Ida Wells the importance of armed self-defense in an environment where the idea of relying on on the state, for personal security, or anything else, was an increasingly absurd proposition. In 1892, it was the Winchester rifle. In 2017, I believe it's the AR-15. And like I always say, if you don't arm yourself, you harm yourself. Black man with a gun. Reloaded. Get the inside, the background, wisdom, information, and experiences of Reverend Ken Blanchard, CIA firearms instructor, gun rights activist, 
that has been involved in this community since 1991. Read about guns, the culture, the community, and the inside stuff behind what you see everywhere else. You can get it firsthand from the guy they call the black man with a gun in his book on Amazon.com. Black man with a gun. Reloaded. In my search for new people in the gun community, I found a guy by the blog name of daddysguns.com. That's daddys-gun.com to be exact. And he wrote and writes some pretty cool stuff. I'm going to share his commentary that he wrote in June, I believe, or July of 2017 about Philando Castile. I asked him to narrate his commentary. At the time of this recording, I hadn't got permission to use his name yet, so I'm not going to, but I hope to have him live to talk further about training, about his thoughts, about history, about life in general. This is the podcast for the voices, the many leaders in the growing gun community. The following program is intended for mature audiences. I went to the range with two boxes of bullets. My gun was on my hip, my CCW in my back pocket. I had a spare magazine and a few targets the size of a sheet of printer paper. As a black gun owner, I was honoring Philando Castile as a brother, not as a victim. I had considered writing about the case, but how much has already been written? Probably thousands of pages of outrage. People have discussed Philando Castile's death from nearly every perspective. They have looked through the videos over and over. I don't have the stomach to see his girlfriend plead for his life on an endless loop, especially when we already know that the next case will likely have the same outcome, and I feared for my life will continue to be a get-out-of-jail-free card when a black man or woman is killed by the police. I could get mad at the NRA for not immediately coming to his aid, but why? They have a history of motivating their membership with a chorus of racist dog whistles. It's a formula that worked for them for a very long time, and I don't expect them to change it. These are the people that were taking the task for not advocating for a fallen black man. Not the police who are supposed to protect him, but a lobbyist group that makes much of his money by appealing to the fears of a frightened white minority. I'm unbothered by the NRA being the NRA. I'm also not a member. So how do we process his death? Become a gun owner. Even if you don't know anything else about the civil rights movement, you know that the lunch counters weren't for us. So young men and women stormed the counters. They took a stand. They didn't do it for the food or because they loved the service. They did it because, despite the fact people thought that they didn't have a right to be there, they knew otherwise. Lando might have suffered in the end, but he had every right to carry, and he knew it. So did Clarence Daniels, a 62-year-old man who was tackled by a vigilante as he entered a Walmart to buy a coffee creamer. So did Corey Jones a church musician who was lawfully carrying a firearm. Like Castillo, he was gunned down by a police officer. In this country, having the right and having that right respected are two different things, especially if you're black. The gap between them is where action takes place. It's where activists are made. But you can't run from it. Get instruction. It's funny how many people overlook this. Too many movies where the hero kills dozens of bad guys after a five-minute training montage. Too many self-proclaimed experts giving bad advice. The uncle that served in the army or the cousin who knew a cop. The guy you saw on YouTube. So find a qualified instructor. One who's versed in the laws in your area. One who prioritizes safety over everything else. He or she can guide you on what gun might suit your purposes and help you find the kind of gear that will let you carry it efficiently and, and discreetly. Responsible gun owners see it as an investment, not a purchase. Training and gear are every bit as important as the gun. Find guidance. Learn the law. When it comes to criminal justice, the deck is stacked against us. This is well documented. So why would you miss an opportunity to slip a card up your sleeve? Learn the law, whether or not you carry. It'll give you the confidence when you're pulled over. Even if you feel absolutely powerless with a police officer, at least you have a leg up when it comes to the judge. 
If you do choose to carry, that knowledge will guide you if you ever have to use force to defend yourself. What you say or don't say afterwards could be the difference between freedom and a lengthy prison sentence. Learn from Philando's death. This is where we get into the area between analyzing a scenario and blaming the victim. I do not think that Philando should have died that day. I don't think that Officer Geronimo Yanez was fit to wear a badge. He was skittish, and so a stop that didn't have to happen in the first place turned into a murder scene. And it could have been worse. Those bullets passed directly into the back seat where his girlfriend's daughter was sitting. Now, did you know that in Minnesota you don't have a legal obligation to tell the police that you're legally carrying unless they ask you? Following his death, dozens of black men and women shared their stories about being pulled over by the police. Many of them said that once they told the officer about their concealed carry license or firearm, they stood perfectly still with their hands in plain view and waited for the officer to prompt them. I'm not pointing these things out to shift the blame from Yanez to Castile. None of these guarantee that Castile will be alive today. But as a black gun owner, I had to develop a plan for getting pulled over. It's going to happen eventually. Learn your history. You need to know the true stories of Tulsa and Rosewood. You need to know about Sam Carrier and Rosa Parks and T.R.M. Howard. Because the truth is, even during Jim Crow, our heroes were pretty absolute about protecting their lives and their families. They realized they were in danger, but they also knew full well that the laws could be leveraged against them for arming themselves. You say the Second, Second Amendment isn't for you? Try telling that to Fannie Lou Hamer a woman whose life was under threat simply because she wanted to exercise the right to vote. Another one of those rights that we are told aren't for us. Or tell that to Ida B. Wells, who proclaimed that the Winchester rifle deserved a place of honor in every black home. Saying the Second Amendment isn't for us sounds too much like giving up, especially when it's voiced by men and women who aren't necessarily pro-gun in the first place. It's hard to lament the fact that you don't have a constitutional right when it's a right that you wouldn't mind seeing stripped from the Constitution. Meanwhile, Baltimore is pushing to impose mandatory one-year sentences for illegal gun possession. If you think Second Amendment rights are, are being infringed upon, then flex them and value them. Stop voting for measures that will chip away at them. It's that simple. A full link to this site can be found at blackmanwithagun.com on this episode's notes when it goes up. Next up, Michael J. Woodland. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland, and today we're going to discuss the drive with me and long-range precision. The thought of getting into long-range precision was not important to me until I joined the military. At my first duty station, they did a blind audition for a selection of snipers with the whole battalion at the range. The day my company was at the range, I was called to the base of the tower with two other soldiers. This is what was told to me in my presence. By me being an E3, they feel that I would not be capable of killing anyone if I was ordered to pull the trigger. In my opinion, there were other factors that were in place. From that moment on, I made it my mission to be the best shot in the company wherever I was stationed. That stood true until I was a drill sergeant. A co-worker of mine and I were talking about the sniper who took the longest shot in our wreck, and we decided to have a contest between the two of us of who can shoot the furthest. The competition never happened, and five years later, the guy who took the longest shot in our wreck was my first sergeant. While in the unit with this first sergeant, I was meeting all kind of celebrities and people who were on top of their game, whether it was fighting or shooting. My drive has always been to be the best at whatever I'm doing and what place to demonstrate it than the location where the best is supposed to be in one unit. Took a few shooting courses while at Fort Benning only because I wanted to shoot all day and get recognized for it. And it turned out that I learned a ton of information that helped me out tremendously. Would you believe me if I told you a leader in my chain of command laughed at me when I stated I wanted to enter the long-range competition? Well, in one of the instructor shooting courses I was attending, the same intent of entering the long-range competition was mentioned to a few instructors, and they were more than willing to give me some knowledge, and they were excited. There was one person who I wanted to tap for knowledge, 
And when I asked for help, he was all over me like a sponge being squeezed dry. Now, this was a creepy type of excitement, but you have to be in the infantry to understand. Not one time did any one of these soldiers outside of my unit laugh at me or joke me in a negative way, but the help was given in a positive atmosphere. Sad part about it is that everyone who assisted me in training was lower in rank than me, and the leader who laughed at me was higher ranking than me. Here in the next week, we will have a conversation with the mystery guy who was the main contributing factor of me winning the 2014 long-range competition in the boat division at Fort Benning and what he is doing these days. This will be an interesting conversation that I will tell you not to miss. Also, if you follow me on Instagram, stay tuned to some cool apparel that is coming my way and I will encourage everyone to go out and get. All this long-range talk has me ready to run to the range, but I'm about to link up with my buddy Johnny King and go over some hunting stuff he wants to go over with me. On top of the other projects we have going on, like the AR-15 bill, getting back into long-range shooting, and now hunting, stick around because the fun is just now beginning. For those who are looking to contact me, visit blackmanwiththegun.com, and under the Leaders tab, click on my name, Michael Woodland, and shoot me an email. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun. Back to you, Ken. Hey, motivation check. Do you like this show? Did you find some worth in at least one thing somebody said so far? If you did, you can motivate me by being a sponsor of this podcast. You can give whatever you think is worth once a month at patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. That's patreon.com forward slash black man with a gun. Become an awesome supporter for next month. Thank you. A few years ago, a friend of mine started this thing called the United States Concealed Carry Association. It's an education, training, and self-defense insurance company now. It's for responsible gun owners. You can get complete peace of mind when you join USCCA today. If you carry a gun for self-defense, you need this. It's a whole package, education, training, and self-defense insurance. Call my friend. The number is one 488 8353 And if you missed that, go to the link at blackmailthegun.com for USCCA. I think that's all I got for this week. I did expect uh, to get some updates from the National African American Gun Association and from our friend and brother out of Detroit, the one and only Marcus Allen Weldon. But we kind of missed each other this week. And I am kind of in the fog since I lost my podcasting partner. And my dog passed away this week. I think I'll share a little bit something about that at the Ken Blanchard podcast. One of the things that I'm doing pretty well is editing podcast. If you are starting a podcast or you have one and you would like to join a network that I have started or have me as your podcast editor and producer, give me a whirl. Give me a call. Gunpodcastnetwork.com Kofi Annan, the Ghanaian diplomat who served as the 7th Secretary General of the United Nations, was quoted as saying, Knowledge is power. Information is liberating. Education is the premise of progress in every society, in every family. Thank you for being a part of mine. Well, all right, that's it for this week. I want to thank our regulars and our guests. I want to thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting this show. Big shout out to our Patreon supporters. Thank you for making this show possible. For more information about anybody that has been on the show today, you can find their links and information at blackmanwithagun.com. Just in case nobody has told you this today, I love you, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next week. Shalom, baby. This show is part of the Gun Podcast Network, an exclusive group showcasing professional pro gun podcasts and broadcasters hitting our targets. <laughs>